Okay, um, it's five past. I think those that are going to join us are probably here. So um, it's good to see so many of you on here. Um, if we do um, some introductions to start with. Um, so um, I'm Tim Rivett. I'm uh, I run Artig um, and am um, running this uh, project with uh, with Transport for Wales, um, looking at, uh, at display interfaces, which is why we're here today. Um, since last time, we've brought um, Rob West on board. Welcome, Rob. Morning, all. Um, yes, as uh, Tim was just saying, I've been brought in to, uh, to this project um, on behalf of Artig to uh, try and extract what the requirements are for, um, for this interface and to, to build the specification um, in a way that um, everyone's happy with. Yeah, um, if you don't you know well. me already, I come from a very technical background, so it's, uh, if you've got techie questions, please feel free to, uh, to shout for me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and um, the uh, the Transport for Wales um, client for this is uh, Kemi. Um, welcome, Hi. Kemi. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kemi Adenubi, and I'm responsible for the proposed procurement for real-time information in Wales. And the main reason for approaching Artig is to make sure that if we actually specify a requirement in our procurement, that it's something that would be applicable for other authorities as well. So I'm very happy that we have this range of representation at the meeting. Excellent, thank you. And um, also from Transport for Wales, we've got uh, Mustafa. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, I've been helping Kemi actually develop the uh, procurement documentation specifications, and uh, you know we've been very keen to have an interface specification which can be used uh, between multiple display providers uh, with our CMS uh, that we are hoping to procure soonish. Hopefully, um, you're um, seeing some people getting onto the um, mural. I'm not sure we're going to use it with a group this size in quite the same way that we did um, last time. Um, so, just to remind ourselves. Um, where this project started. Um, Transport for Wales are um, wanting to go out and procure um, a content management system that they can use to drive all of their display fleet um, to help reduce the number of um, places that they need to um, put in messages and, and manage things. Um, and it's a similar challenge that a number of other authorities um, in the UK have um, got and have been thinking about what they might be able to do about for a while. Um, and so um, this, the opportunity to develop a um, common interface between content management systems and displays or content management systems and other content management systems um, uh, is uh, is one that's been um, around for a while um, and with with the Welsh procurement coming up it's 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 a excellent opportunity to try and um, progress to a point where we've actually got something that um, that's um, usable and workable. Um, Artig have done work on this in the past um, and got to the point of um, defining some of the principles that you'd have um, in, in an interface, um, but um, didn't get to the um, point six years ago now. Um, 
of um, actually defining the technical interface. Um, because at that point there wasn't the uh, the demand from authorities or suppliers. Um, but I think from the conversations I've had over the last couple of months with people, um, I think that's changed. There's, there are a number of procurements that um, will be coming out over the next um, year or so, um, in addition to the Transport for Wales, where um, the uh, the procuring authorities would like to uh, to to see um, the the current um, challenges that they've got in managing content on displays um, at least partly resolved, if not fully resolved. Um, and so, um, what we're trying to do um, in this work is get a consensus view across the industry as to what um, a basic interface should support. Um, and that's what we're going to look at fundamentally today. Um, then um, developing um, that view into a protocol, something technical um, that, uh, that, that achieves the, the basic information requirements. Um, documenting it so you know how to use it and implement it for those of you that are suppliers um, and um, develop a plan for how we um, move it forward from um, basic interface design into something that supports um, graphics and more enhanced um, functions. Um, and the way that we're um, doing it um, is the way that um, Wales have identified um, as a way of classifying displays, which seems to work um, generally. Um, so you have a basic text-based display, something like a three-line NED that you might have seen um, in lots of different places that provides basic um, real-time vehicle arrival and departure information. You might see a text-based message on it. And um, if you lose communications, it probably will show the timetable for the rest of the day. Um, that sort of thing, the basic functionality that's been around for quite a long time and quite widespread. Um, then um, you... Um, introduce some more complexity. You might have a TFT um, or these days a um, some of the um, LED displays are capable of showing basic graphics and things like that. Um, that's got a bit more functionality than the basic text display. Um, you might put weather on it, some um, advertising or promotional messages about public transport. Um, you might put a video feed on, um, that sort of thing. Um, it's got more graphical um, information on it as well as the basic text because this is building on top of um, text-based display. Um, and um, typically that will have some decent communications and, and constant mains power to it. Um, these days, um, there are lots of um, off-grid displays. Um, so displays that are either solar powered or battery powered, um, and therefore um, have some limitations and challenges as to, to what you can display and um, um, the amount of um, information you can um, transmit to a display to help keep um, power requirements low. Um, may or may not be able to show graphical content, but the fact that it's off grid, it's not connected to mains power, means that it's got some specialist requirements um, that, that needs to be considered over and above. Um, the text and graphical displays. So we're looking at those three types of display. Today, we really we really want to um, 
concentrate on the the basic text type display um, and the the core requirements um, that that display has um, and how we might um, get information to that display or to a content management system that drives that display so that um, you can if we come back to the original requirement how can i put in and manage displays from a single content management system if i'm buying them from lots of different suppliers um, over the course of years that might have you know specialist requirements for for some locations and things like that um, and so today we want to look at what are those basic fundamental requirements that are consistent across text, graphical and off grid um, to make sure that we get the foundations right. Um, has anybody got any questions at this point? Is that clear what we're wanting to achieve and where we're coming from? It is. But, um, sorry, Tim, I, I seem to still be on the wrong Muriel. I've done two different ones, but I've not seen what you're seeing, or should I not be seeing what you're seeing? Because I haven't got project controls, and I'm seeing that Chris is on your one, but I'm on the wrong one. Right, OK. That's interesting. Sorry, project objectives. I haven't got that kind of stuff, so I'm definitely on the wrong one, I think. OK. Um, I created a new one um which uh is the one that on the screen that i'm sharing now just while that's going on tim of me yeah is is there um any enthusiasm from device manufacturers to make their devices open in terms of any device drivers that not that might be needed um i know there's people from infotech and maybe other device manufacturers um i was just wondering if they've got any comments around that The fact Sorry, I did. I forgot to take it off mute. <laughs> um, yeah, we make we all our displays are open protocols anyway. So, uh, but yeah, we 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 would be um, interested in obviously talking to whoever to make all our devices open. We don't have uh, an issue was, with that. So I didn't. Who was speaking just then? Sorry. So, uh, sorry, Nig it's not Nigel from Infotech. Hello, Nigel. Hi. Um, yeah, we're 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 very open. All as I say, in all our protocols. Uh, uh, are open we can yeah we do open application displays as well so that if need be people can load up um their own software onto a linux or windows based platform so or we can use our tetris controller which is uh, um which again is open protocols excellent I'll, I'll get in touch with you after if i may yeah certainly Are there any um, other suppliers that are doing a similar open platform? Yeah, Claudio from uh, Italy, ISIS. Um, so we, as I mentioned in my introduction, we also do onboard and we are now leaving the experience of a new standardized protocol, which uh, you might all uh, have heard about. It's called IT4PT and it's uh, pretty much the same idea um but applied to the to the onboard with uh, on top of that some uh, standardized management of uh, power for example um so let's say that we are quite familiar with the standardization and uh, we are definitely open to make uh, uh any of our uh, displays uh, um controllable by means of uh, standard protocols thank you are there any software suppliers that have adopted open protocols and make them available 
with with our product, which is open as well. The, I, I mean, it's Mike Jacklin here from Eto World. Um, uh, it's an interesting question. I, I I have a similar question actually from uh, IT for PT and also for Tim on the SENS side. Are, are there open standards already being developed um, within the kind of usual kind of series and frameworks at all? I'm not aware of anything on the GTFS GTFS RT side yet, but I just wondered if there's anything um, within the kind of normal frameworks of open standards that's being developed at the moment that might help for this. Um, so, um, as Claudia said, um, IP for um, IT for PT um, have been doing some work on um, this. Um, VDV in Germany have got um, various um, guidance um, documents available. Um, most of those, though, are specifying the content that should be displayed rather than the protocol between a a particular um, display and a, and a controlling system. Um, but um, there there is there is a move to in this direction um, in a number of places, but um, <laughs> there's there's nothing fundamentally out there that we could just go um ah oh, yes we'll just use that um but there's quite a lot of experience and and um things that we can borrow from um things like siri um for example um with stop monitoring um that that's got a lot of the fundamental data um in it and ways of um um sharing data uh, in flexible ways is is there any sorry i thought it was just on you is there any um global provision in america australia where they might have specified to a later stage than what's happening in europe and the uk that you're aware of tim no, Europe's more advanced than most of the rest of the world where systems are more closed um, in many ways. I think that's probably the right way to put it. So that's why we're um, setting out on this path, because there isn't anything that we can just lift and um go yeah that's the one that should be adopted um we are having gonna have to break a bit of ground here um but it is I think something that um that other places are um going to be interested in um and in the same way that in the uk we when we developed um um, some of the original protocols, the Arctic server to server protocol, that was similar to work being done elsewhere and formed a large part of what's now the Siri standard. Um, and Trans Exchange has gone on and become a large part of NetX and, and things like that. So, um, you know, uh, th these things do have a habit of becoming wider standards. Um, Tim. Yes, uh, the, the David. Thing, yeah, yeah David. morning. Morning. Sorry, I was at the public emergency a few minutes late. Um, I, I'm wondering the degree to which we think this problem could be solved by extending existing standards. I'm thinking specifically of Siri, you know, with its real time nature. It feels quite, quite a good fit in many ways. Uh, or the, uh, whether we think this is, I think, the this is probably going to, you know, it's an open question. I don't necessarily think it's going to be a, a straight answer. Whether it's going to be extensions to existing um, standards or whether we'd see that a new standard will be formed, which is going to adopt some of the concepts and ideas from existing standards. I don't know if you've got a strong feel of which way that's going to go, whether it's going to be something that has adopted the ideas and concepts of Siri, or it will be Siri with some extensions that are required mm -hmm. in this particular use case. 
um, that to an extent is what we're here to to to, to work out, um, and that's the challenge that I think um, Rob's going to have um, in working out how we take the the basic requirements um, and turn them into something that people can can accept. Yeah, absolutely. If I ju can just um, add um, my thoughts on it. Um, we've talked a lot about the existing standards and I think, if I'm not mistaken, it, that's mostly concerned with the data content. So Siri has, tells you a whole bunch of different attributes um, that you might want to include. Um, but there's a whole other piece to this jigsaw, which is to do with the communication protocol, the network protocol underneath all of that. Um, you know, are we just all assuming that it's an HTTP connection and we're sending data down it? Or I, what I suspect is the case is that it's a whole lot more complicated than that. And we need to deal with um, things like device discovery and security. Um, and I also want to get to the bottom, really, of, of how current systems handle those types of um, interfaces, um, you know, in addition to the discussion about the data content, the you know, does it look like Siri or does it look like something else? Um, so it's it's a sort of a multi-level discussion that we really need to have to bottom out what it is that we're trying to specify. And that discussion there is, is beginning to split the um, big picture down to different levels. So you've talked about a data level there, a transport level, a device level, and those are quite complicated topics on, on each of them. Um, so it might be good practice to maybe split down and have those three different levels in the discussion and, and more levels that might come out of the discussions. Yep, yeah, and um, today um, what we're going to um, look at is what are the basic um, information requirements for the for the simple text message display. Um, you know, so what are those data elements? Um, then we'll look at what do we need from a fault and reporting perspective. Um, you know, how do you know whether the display is working or not? And when something goes wrong, how do you get alerted? Then the more getting more technical um, with the interface design. Um, and some of those technical um, requirements, which um, some people might want to um, um, leave at that point, run away as things get a bit more technical. But some of you I know are um, <laughs> are, are desperately waiting for, for that bit. Um, but we need to understand what those basic um customer information requirements are, I guess, to start with, with the basic information. But you're right, Stephen, in that you need to break it down into those those three layers, which is why we've got this structured in the way that we have. OK, so um, we'll move on to um, the first um, bit. So last time we met, um back in august um w we asked some questions about the sort of information that you might expect to see um and capabilities um in the um for for each of the three different types of displays um and um these are the things that came out um of that the fit for a text display. Um, we'd like to validate that, make sure that these are correct, that none of them are um, things that actually practically you can't do on, a, on the most basic type displays, um, and make sure that there's nothing missing from that, because that will then help us make sure that we've got the right data there. So. Um, for um, for this, we'll we can go through and make sure that 
you're clear about what's meant by this and make sure that that Robbie's is clear on thinking and that sort of thing. So to start with, the display needs to know its time um, to either display that on the display or, or do background processing. So it's got to get time somehow. Um, it's going to need to know about the operator. If we think of it of um sorry Tim, is is it uh, do you mind if I interject or do you want me to put my no. hand up and yeah on, on the time we, we need to know the time source. Um if, if you go to the system, you know, it might be losing time. If you go back to your server, you might not use the same standard time. So the, require, the, the discussion about time needs to discuss where the time source comes from and the frequency that it's um, reset if it drifts. Yeah. Oh. What happened there? I've I lost my mouse. It wasn't me, I hope. <laughs> no, I doubt it. Um, <laughs> OK. My, my on that one, window closed for some reason. So, Stephen, on that one, uh, it's an interesting question about source. But uh, I was wondering, rather than saying you need to provide a source, maybe we flip it around and say that the time has to be accurate within X number of seconds, and then leave it up to uh, the supplier. You know how they do that because yeah. this is not an interface question. That's not an interface question. That that's more of a how do they source that? And different suppliers will do that in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, and, and from our perspective, we we go to a, a verified internet source to get the time from. So it might be that concept. You go to a verified source to get the time, and then the frequency of how often it's reset if it drifts. So the yeah. specification doesn't necessarily need to specify that. Um, but there needs to be some commentary that this is the expectation of how it will work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, that is a good question. You know, accuracy, uh, and it's probably something we can discuss now. W what is a, a good accuracy measure? Because, you know, within one second, you could say, well, that probably, you know, if it's 20 seconds, it probably doesn't matter. But if it's five minutes, there's clearly a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is there a view from anyone else on what what is an acceptable limit? Is, is it uh, thirty seconds? Is it ten seconds? Or is it a minute? Thirty seconds would be too long for the way we do things now. Um, a few seconds wouldn't be any issue. Um, so I think our expectation on existing suppliers is that there is a verified time source somewhere off the internet that's got an accurate time. And we reset that once per day sort of frequency. And then any variation during a day isn't going to happen unless there's a hardware fault locally or there's an issue locally. Um, so it's that concept of updating the time and doing that regularly. Yeah. So what if we said uh, up to five seconds uh, and it has to be updated, um, as I say, one, at least once a day? Yeah, and that once a day, you know, if if you want to be um, to be really accurate, there's there's no reason why you can't do an update of the time every so many seconds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll come back to time when we start to think about um, the the technical implications for the interface because. Um, I know how how often are you refreshing data and things like this? But this is a I mean, if you're going to dis the display needs to know time to be able to do various other things. It might be displaying it, so there's some ac level of accuracy there. Um, it then um, for to be able to display um, a um, a departure, it needs to know the operator. Um, for that um, service, it needs to know the service number. But just on the operator, Tim, where does the operator details come from? What's the link 
as to the operator. Is it the operator code and where does that come from? So there's there's um you need to consider who your operators are, what their codes are, and the source of the codes so you can get their presentation name. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, uh, operator codes, like a lot of transport data, uh, can be a bit of a world of, of hell. Um, it's standardized to a certain degree on the national operator code. Um, and so I think that would be the, the best way to go. I think what the industry would benefit from is a lot more, um, uh, what's the right word, uh, collaboration and agreement on what are the correct operator codes for the different um, uh, the different uh, franchises. Because we see, that's what the difference is we see where somebody might think that um, it belongs to a, a, a one, one operator and somebody else has got a different view of it and the different service bundings can get a bit complicated. It's one of those things that 95, 99% of it is straightforward and then there's that five, one to five percent which gets very complicated. There's also work team with DFT in defining that. There's been recent communications which has uh, reduced any duplications and overlaps mm -hmm. in operator codes. But in terms of from an interface point of view, uh, clearly, you know, it is whatever it's being passed between the, the CMS and the display boards uh, is whatever the display board is going to show. It's not going to have any control over what the operator name is. It is literally going to show what it's been sent. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the complication there, though, is that we'll be picking up scheduled data and real time predictions, and they may, may come from different sources. So mm. there's not a consistency of operator code. You, you might not be tying that up. So it, it's important that the operator code used in the schedule information, the operator or the link, not necessarily the operator code, that there's a link to operators in the schedule data, which is the same operator in the real time data, which is the same operator in the display information to tie that up to make sure we've got that consistency of operator and operators have preferred public facing names. They might yeah. have different commercial names and different depot names. Um, so it's making sure we have the correct name title for an operator in the output that we show to the public. Yeah, and, and the same goes with, with a lot of other things because when we come to talk, you know, destination um, is on here, you've got those same things. For this though, that's, needs to be sorted out in the CMS and the prediction engine before it's getting to the display. The display is just being told what to what to show. Those decisions need to be made earlier in the in the chain. Keith. Sorry, I was only going to say what you've just said. I think from my understanding what you want here isn't about the data quality or anything like that. It's more so what should be shown on the display. Mm. Uh, the data quality is completely outside of what we're trying to achieve here from what I understood we were talking about. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, well, clearly it's worth highlighting that as a risk that if the data quality is poor, then this, you know, the, the CMS interface to display board interface is not going to resolve that. Mm. Yeah. And that's like with any system, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think the way we should approach this um, essentially would be uh, some kind of guidance in the interface documentation that would say, you know, the data attribute that we're interested in is the operator presentation name and the guidance is, you know, this, this is how you should go about holding on to that or supporting it in your CMS, but it is just guidance, um, which sort of hopefully fits the bill for everybody it, it keeps the specification simpler because we're just telling you what the attribute is but it gives the developer of a cms some clue as to what it is that we're expecting to see um coming through yeah 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 okay so service number um the scheduled arrival time um and the real arrival time um so that may or may not be a prediction i think that's that's something to um to to work through um i think you would need to rename that to predictive arrival time 
So, yes. Yeah. Does it need the existing real arrival time and another box for predicted arrival time? There may be a difference in it. So the prediction might say it's due in five minutes. It actually turns up six minutes later. So knowing the real time and the predicted yeah. time could be useful. But from a display point of view, what, what's the display going to do? And what's it going to tell the customer? It's always going to give a prediction until it happens. Yeah. It, there, there's there's no, no, so within the prediction standards, time is important, yeah. Yeah, yeah. With, with, within a lot of the interface standards for things like Siri and things like that, um, you've got the, it's scheduled at this point, and this is the predicted time that's a clock face time. And so you need to then make a decision about how you present that to the customer. You know, rail might have the two side by side as clock times, um, but bus typically would they turn that into three or four minutes. And, and so that's something that we'll need to, to, to work through as, as what people want. I, I, I think, think so, so just if I, I can add as well, I, I think it's very important from the passenger that they understand whether this is a timetable arrival time or whether it's a predicted arrival time based on the real time information available on the screen. I think sometimes unless that's clear to a passenger, the source of the information and, and how how much they can trust that information, it's, it's quite important to be able to signal to the customer, the passenger who may not realise that a clock face means it's a prediction uh, as opposed to the actual time being a, a, a sort of reverting back to the the uh, timetable the arrival time um, because of the, the absence of real time data. It's quite important, I think, to be able to, to within the CMS be able to very clearly signpost the source of the information, therefore giving the passenger a, a, a sense of whether they can trust that information or not in terms of its real time veracity. How do you do that with the display with a limited number of characters without you know using up lots of characters? I mean, one thought I had was, you know, where it's a actual time. So, for example, 10.25, that is always a scheduled time. Where it says five minutes, that means it's predicted. Is that a way of working around that? Because otherwise, you know, you have to put a star next to it and or something else to highlight yeah. this is real time or otherwise. I, I completely agree with you. I think, but it, I think it needs to be standardised and then passengers be made aware of, of, of what that convention means to them. Yeah, there's yeah. also a increase in interest in multicolored LEDs. Um, so we could use a concept of red, green and amber, say, to give an indication um, so that the use of color might be more prevalent. So the specification needs to be able to anticipate that future requirement and be able to specify how it gets used. And uh, yeah. just go Rob, then Dave. Um, Sorry, Tim, could I just go back on the predicted time? If, if you, my, my experience of looking at the rail systems, they give you an expected time, um, and that tends to be a scrolling line. So you get the scheduled time, and then you get information that gives you the expected time of the arrival. Um, so is there a need for that predicted and expected, which has different purposes? But, but potentially and that, and that's one of the that's why i was saying there's there's the difference in in different standards and whether they they yeah. produce it, sending it through as, as clock face or or x minutes rob hi is it worth um, recording just, that note tim that's what i think i've done there in the, in that that i've got highlighted i can't quite see it it's too uh, right. small <laughs> yeah rob Hi, uh, just to pick up on Mustafa's point, really, I can just share our experience in Derbyshire that the, the simpler, the better for the end user. So just the approach of uh, the scheduled time just being a stated time, 10, 26. Everybody knows or has got seems to have got used to that in Derbyshire. And then a predicted time is just a minute countdown. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, the results, the effect on the end user is negligible in our experience, whether it's predicted time or scheduled time as long as there's a time on the display that says when the bus is going to arrive we found that there's been very little kickback from that very little confusion virtually none so people just like that the two options of scheduled time 
predicted time, the simpler the better is our experience works best. Yeah. Okay. Dave? Um, yeah, I was I just wonder if there's any any usability research on this, um, which might be useful. I mean, I can think um of, we discussed a bit of the different things you can do. Um Colo is useful, um the clock face or the countdown is useful, or we've got used to it, and the some annotations useful as well. But I do wonder if we've all been in the industry quite a long time. Certainly when I first came to this, when I'd never handled transport data, it, I didn't understand the difference. And when someone explained it to me, that was fine, but it did need to be explained. I think um, if we look at what app developers have done, that might be useful. I mean, that's the, I don't know if you can see, but that's the first group app. And they've used all three of those conventions. They've used color, they've used some annotation, and they've used um, the, the clock face versus the countdown. So I think we um, um making sure that we make it very easy for users and don't assume that they've been they've come into this with the knowledge that we've got, that this convention, there's a convention which says minutes means countdown and clock face means schedule. We, we have done some yeah. research in South Yorkshire with disability groups and we've trialled a multicoloured LED and we've presented scheduled information in amber <coughs> excuse me, and predicted information in green. So a multicolour LED has, has that new concept of whether it's predicted or scheduled time using colour. Mm. We're yeah. quite open to share that information and feedback from the group. Yeah, 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 that would be useful. Uh, Claudio. Yeah, just a quick uh, contribution uh, since we were uh, um, uh, speaking about uh, colored uh, RGB LEDs. So a quick contribution from other countries or experiences we had elsewhere in, uh, in Europe and in other parts of uh, or in other continents. So. Um, as far as we see, our perception of the LED is uh, mostly about uh, a, a device to provide prompt information, easy to access information, so very, very simple and basic. Um, we we also have some operators, and we, we we were in discussion with operators about colored LEDs. But uh, most of the times, uh, the uh, the tests uh, they they made. Um, turned out to to to, to have the uh, monochromatic LED as probably the best uh, option to provide a long uh, um, readability, uh, long distance readability, and uh, a prompt information. On the other hand, also some colored uh, cases were uh, uh, were also implemented. So it really depends on the on the case scenario. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, also need to present destination name to um, on the display, and again, what that is will need to be determined by the source. But destination name is important. Then, um, for some displays, at least, um, via information is important and some LED and simpler text displays will provide via. Um, again, that would need to come from source systems. Um, there is a point of interest concept as well, similar to via. Um, is, is it beneficial having points of interest as you um, sit on a service? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Then cancellations. Customers need to know whether a service is cancelled. There's different ways of presenting that um, from different systems. Either it disappears entirely or, or it says cancelled, but that data needs to be available. And, and that concept as well, Tim, the notion of delayed, making that prominent. So maybe if it's You've got colour available using colour coding to tell you the service is delayed. So it's still running, but it's not running on time. Right. OK, yeah. Yeah. And, and rather than just disappearing, I think it'll be you know, more beneficial from a customer point of view and less uh, yeah, annoying when it says cancelled rather than just disappearing. You think what the hell's going on? Yeah, so I guess the 
that gets to a question about um, how controlled and, and what are we leaving up to the display to make a decision on? Um, because sometimes that decision is made in the display. Sometimes it's made in the content management system at the moment as to what gets pushed out for a cancellation. Dave. Yeah, just to say, I think we'd, it'd be useful to know what the source systems can do here. I know that cancellations is quite new to the industry, and I think the um, uh, the systems that aggregate um, that data are going to be able to use, uh, um, consume cancellations when they're available. But uh, from the operators that we've worked with, it requires new systems to be built, new protocols to be developed, and crucially, human resource to actually push these cancellations out um, in a, a consumer-facing way. And that can be quite different from um, having cancellations in the system from a, um, a non-public-facing way. Uh, everything from the reason they put in and things like that, instead of it being quite a technical reason, they want to put a consumer-facing reason, and you've got to update different systems. So I think that might be something just to um, to think about as well in terms of whether the uh, source data, appropriate source data, will be available for cancellations both at launch and um, and in future, and being able to account for that and um, uh, adopt it in future if necessary. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sonia. Can we also add um, diversion to delayed, please? Yeah. Uh, can I just go back to a point you uh, made um, regarding whether the display makes a decision on whether to show cancelled or uh, or not show it at all? Yeah, I, I think the, the ideal position that CFW are looking for is the CMS has control over what will be displayed. Um, and that's the point where you, you make that decision on it disappears or it just has a cancelled message next to it. Um, so, uh, apart from certain things, like, for example, uh, maybe time, you know, most things are whatever the CMS says goes. Uh, yeah. uh, it's a general principle thing rather than specific to any one of these items. Yeah. OK. Uh, Claudio, is that a new hand or an old hand? Oh, no, sorry. I just left my, my hand. Yeah, no, that's OK. Um, OK, then there are three types of messages that were identified. Um, so uh, service information messages that you might use for things like roadworks causing delays. Um, a diversion message for a, for a route or something like that. Um, general information, so um, semi sort of advertising. You know, there's new timetables next week, things that aren't going to immediately impact somebody's journey that they're making now. You know, there's new tickets available, that sort of thing. Um, and then um, emergency messages that typically would would block out all the rest of it. You know, no services because of snow or, you know, um, please evacuate the area type messages. Um, Stephen, then Keith. OK, thanks. Is it worth specifying where that message shows? Um, you, you, you mentioned two types, two different types of messages, maybe from my perspective, making a suggestion. Maybe you have a scrolling line for the first two types of messages and the full screen for the emergency message. Um, so it's a definition of where the message shows. Yes. And some form of priority, probably. So if you've got a service message um, that you're putting out, that might override uh, a general information message because you said give it a higher priority because it's a more urgent message. Yeah. OK, Keith. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a, a message again, but it might be useful to have a, a bus stop closed message and if we're looking at the timetable again is it useful to and the look ahead really to have the display uh stop closed until um services commence at x 
type like um, message so people know when the stops closed and when it starts and all that kind of stuff. But it's probably more detail than you want. But mm -hmm. Mustafa. Um, so in, in relation to messages, um, clearly your basic displays, you're kind of limited to three lines. So it's nice and easy. It either goes at the bottom scrolling line uh, or the full screen one. Uh, but for our more uh, graphical displays, I'm wondering whether this bit kind of takes over the third line of, you know, uh, of your timetable information or does it have its own dedicated area unless it's the full screen one, which kind of takes over everything in any case? Yeah. Yeah. That's something that we need to consider um, is, is how you develop on this. Um, yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, and then um, multi language, um, given we're talking about Wales um, here, um, needs to be able to cope with multi language. Um, how many is an interesting question. I We've guess. Got four dialects in Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Nigel. I was just going back to the previous one about the uh, the messages uh, um, on the uh, more graphic um, display. There is some intelligence you can do inside the display, which allows you to take over parts of the display at the time of messages, but then have the uh, um, when there's, there's there's no message to show you basically show that the, the amount of information you want to take so you can prioritize areas of the screens. Yeah. And then just going on whilst we're talking about uh, uh, bilingual. Um, yeah, that we do it already for 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 Transport for Wales Rail. So. So uh, and on this one, are we talking about languages or character sets? Because again, you know, much of this will come from the CMS, um, and you know, if it's all in a certain character set, whatever the CMS sends, it will display it. But if it can't do so, as an example, Arabic writing, that, this that is won't true. That, won't they? Yeah, I mean, basically, we've uh, um, for Transport for Wales REL, we've they've only asked for it in Welsh. Um, we have done um, Arabic for overseas projects, um, etc. But again, it's whether to, you have to use a full matrix display to be able to get to do it, and then you're you're restricted. Uh, you couldn't do it with a three line nine dot display because you wouldn't get the characters. So, so I think it's character that, set is more important than anything else, whereas language will be down to the CMS for textual, but the text to speech might be the area we need to look at. Yeah. Would, would you be requiring uh, more than Welsh? I mean, that's uh, you know, for where you are, for, for, for what you're looking at. So for, I think dedicated uh, transport hubs, you may want to consider other languages, tourist hotspots, for example. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. And there is a concept there of tying back to international standards to define the character sets and uh, where it's coming from. So device manufacturers might need to specify the character sets they support from the ISO list of character sets. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. I was going to say, wouldn't you want the displays to register what they support and what they don't into the CMS and have an interface that supports that? So you yeah. might get a, a display, if you're using off the shelf displays, you might get a display that does support Welsh, you might get one that doesn't. If it gets, you know, both support English, you might get one that then will hold on and display if it's sent both language sort of varieties of text it would display the english but if it doesn't support welsh it would know or it would be no register not to be sent that text or it would register its lack of support for that yep yep, yep. okay then um look ahead schedule look ahead so it needs 
the display needs to be able to to hold a, a, an amount of um, timetable schedule data, look ahead for loss of communications and and you know actually real time system might not supply more than sixty minutes in advance. Um, but if you've got a service every two hours, you might want to display um, data above above that. So it needs to hold and transfer. Should you look so, ahead? Um, sorry, sorry, Tim. There's a couple of hands, and I wanted to ask questions. Ah, well, so. oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who have we got? We've got Nigel. Is that Nigel gone? Mustafa, then. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of that schedule, look ahead. Um, do, do how many bus? Oh, how many stops were? Oh, sorry. How many buses worth of data? should a display show you know for again as an example uh if you've got three lines should it show the next three services and the last one scroll with messages etc or should it, it be the next four because you know for, for a, a busy bus stop where you've got a bus every couple of minutes you probably want to know the next four or five because your specific bus may be the fifth one and that's only six minutes away just adding on to that, there is on our free line LEDs in South Yorkshire, we show the next six departures. So the concept of scrolling and giving a line number. Mm. Um, so the specification needs to incorporate that. We do it with a line number in South Yorkshire. We show the first line is fixed. It never changes until the bus drops off. And then lines two, three, four, five, six, the date time message. Scroll. So we've actually got seven lines that we display, six departures plus um, seven or eight lines, actually, the time and a message. And does that scroll between how many actual lines, how many physical lines? Physically, there's three lines. Okay. Line one is always fixed. It, yeah. it doesn't change. Lines two and three scroll between the next six departures and messages and time. OK, yeah. So in yeah. different areas that will work differently. So the specification needs to be able to handle those different scenarios in, in a different location. For example, it may want 10 departures. Um, so there's that concept of the maximum number. They might not want to show more than three lines and they always stay fixed until the first line drops off and they all move up. Mm. Um, so it needs to be able to handle those different scenarios. OK, Keith and Nigel. Sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, uh, the specification obviously depends. I know we're looking at text ones, but it depends on display, display as people have said. Um, and also it's consistency, I suppose. I know we're looking at text now, but if you were looking to do different things and show expected and departure on um, fancy TFTs, but you can't do that on these ones, you know, there's the issue of consistency and then confusing passengers that way. And lastly, um, I suppose a display, it could do Welsh and English to present it. Uh, more languages might be confusing, but you could have more languages in audio uh, for those people. So whilst it says English and Welsh, it will announce in different languages to try to overcome and support more languages of people's requests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there is that concept, though, that in Wales, that might be the primary language. So the output needs to be using the Welsh alphabet and the special characters that make up the Welsh language. So I'm not too sure of the technical details, but you might have funny accents above letters. So the character set will give you those symbols. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's maybe my ignorance because I, I, I don't live in Wales. And <laughs> But does it not use the same alphabet? OK, so there, there's some specific um, pronunciation of certain characters, so two L's, for example, but they, they use the same English alphabet set, don't they, as such? Possibly, yes. I don't know either. But if, <laughs> if we're doing something in Scotland, you know, does Scotland use the Celtic language and they have special characters? If, yeah. we're, if our vision is to do something which becomes adopted more globally, then being aware of the requirements for characters and where they come from means it's more easily adopted by the French who do have accents on their characters. Mm. Uh, Arabia that has a different character set and different um, symbols. 
to incorporate that in the design. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Nigel? I'm, I'm just going to say on, on the Welsh language, yes, it is the same characters uh, as, 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 as English characters. Um, so, and it's quite, we, we do the intelligence inside the display. So we take the raw data and then we translate it into Welsh. On the text to speech, um, there is, we did have a, um, or Transport for Wales had a battle between North Wales and South Wales because they do pronounce words differently, but they did come up with uh, um, uh, a way of keeping everybody happy. Uh, so on the text to speech, again, we just take the raw data and we translate it into Welsh. So that's that. But other languages is going to be you, you, do, you have to have a different uh, text to speech um, platform. So if you want to do it in Arabic, uh, 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 for example, you'd have to have a different text to speech. We could look at that. That wouldn't be. And again, how we would put that on, uh, um, uh, on uh, as a text uh, uh, textual uh, writing on the on the display. Um, but again, you've got to watch the character. Uh, types. The other one I was going to mention was the uh, schedule look ahead uh, where you were talking about how much information you show. The display can do whatever is required or displays can do whatever you require within the limitations of the display. So if you've got a three line and you have a fixed next service, you could then have the second and quite often the second line would be the calling points or the vias. Um, and then the third line would be uh, the additional services, second, third, fourth, so people could see when they're coming. But and it would change depending on where the location of the display. If you've got a busy, you know, high street where five or six uh, um, different services call at that stop, yeah, you might want to show those five or six. If you've got a a small town where you've got you know a bus that comes through every thirty minutes, you might only want to show. The next three services. Yeah, I mean, but everything point, can right? be scripted for the location. They don't all have to be exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It has to be per per bus stop or per uh, display settings. So each yeah. one can have completely different setting to uh, another one. You know, five minutes up the road. Yeah. So is, is that breaking down the message into different elements there? So you have departure information service x is due to depart in so many minutes you've then got other types of information so is it worth specifying the message content and splitting that down into the levels it might be be constructed into and specifying the details there so if you've got a display where you want the first line to show a departure and then the second line to show a via the via's different information and you specify that and where it gets shown on the display. We, we also mentioned points of interest. So you've got a third component there, points of interest. Yeah. You might want to set your display up to show on a third line, points of interest, and then a different mechanism to show uh, departures in the future. So then you're looking at how you can specify the content for freelance LD in different locations showing different information yeah okay um keith and then claudio claudio then keith's gone to sleep <laughs> oh, sorry, <I'm> sorry keith <laughs> please keith carry on Sorry, there was two things. There's a balance upon what the CMS says in its data to the display and what the display can do. Because as Nigel was saying, you know, it makes sense for the display to be able to um, uh, do the different uh, visual languages and um, voice because you don't necessarily want the content to be sent uh, in English and Welsh and so forth from the central system from a data um, load perspective, potentially, and, um, and duplicate it in different languages. So it could make sense that the display does that. Uh, likewise, a look ahead window, uh, you might send 60 minutes of data, um, which might have lots of arrivals, but if the display will maybe choose to say, I want to start show the first one of route one, you know, in, in two minutes, forget the next route one ones, which are three minutes and four minutes, but show service two. 
So you didn't necessarily want that logic on the CMS, but if the display does that logic, that kind of makes sense. Mm. Yeah. How do you okay. know the capability of the display? Where does that come from? Well, that would come back from the specification and later discovery point of view and the configuration from that. But so is, is there a notion that we need something that tells us this display type has this capability? Yes. Yeah, and if you look later on, we ask that question. Yeah, Claudio. Yeah, yeah, maybe this will also answer this last question. So um, our idea is that the only possible uh, way to maximize uh, uh, the versatility of the display, and with this I mean uh, the ability of using different characters, different languages, uh, displayed uh, uh, or even putting promptly pictures, pictograms, uh, uh, whatever can be can be used is basically to uh, have a, a graphic uh, uh, use of the displays, even when it can, uh, when it uh, when we speak about LEDs. Um, so this is possible one when uh, there is a, a full matrix display, so no more separate uh, LED uh lines for example um when there is a high resolution um so very small pixel pitch and the last but not least uh, when the content can be easily controlled which means uh, possibly by via html this means that uh, whatever is done on the cms side uh, is applicable to any kind, any make or manufacturer of displays, and especially any technology. So it can be LED, it can be TFT, or whatever, but it's driven by uh, the same HTML uh, formatted content. Um, we 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 have some some cases, some experience with this because we we, we struggle to find something that could work as as a uh, softer from the uh, content management side uh, with the big uh, uh, signs for highways, uh, with the small signs for uh, uh, bus stops, uh, uh, with the onboard uh, TFTs uh, on trains and buses. And then we, we found out that possibly HTML driven content is the, is the only answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, branding name. So um, this is different from operator name and, and um, line because sometimes operators call collections of lines by things like Skylink or um, you know Red Root and things like that. So that needs to be available. Um, and um, audio announcements. Um, and how you manage um, that within an interface. Um, we've talked about that in multi-language quite a lot. So those are the core bits of information that were identified last time um, as being needed to be supportive. Is there anything missing from that before we move on? One thought that's just popped into my head. Um, I don't know if any existing signs specify this, but um, some indication of the fact that this is the last bus of the day or the last bus on a particular service. Um, I don't think I've ever seen that, but it would be very useful even earlier on in the day to see a message that said, you know, the last bus you can possibly catch from this bus stop is at 22.15 tonight and it will be service one. Um, It has been done. Transport for London do something where they put a message up um, saying this is the last bus of the day when there's only one displayed. Um, or they did at least in countdown one, whether they do in two or not, I don't know, but I've seen it done. Yeah. Sonia. Yeah, I was just going to mention, and I'm not sure if it's um, relevant, is cross journey predictions under schedule look ahead. 
um, because it, it, it's an issue that we've got and I think it, it's dealt with within the CMS and therefore it's always going to be dealt with there as opposed to within the real time uh, display. Um, but I, I guess it's something that it, it's a big issue for us, mm. put it that mm. way. Yeah. OK. Uh, Keith. Bob, sorry. Oh, sorry. It was only linking to Rob's again. It was it's the message to point about having a whether a bus stop is in service or not service and rather to have it blank and please refer to timetable is that message of um, no services due, which links to Rob's um, end of service and last service. But mm. also Tim, I did put a little note on the thing about accessibility for the bus or is that going to be a given that it will be in the data set? or everyone would expect the bus to have a wheelchair, therefore you don't need to tell people anymore, or should you still have the uh, accessibility symbol or something? Uh, l legally, the buses are supposed to be accessible yeah. now. Um, <laughs> in South uh, Yorkshire, we've dropped the accessibility symbol because all buses in theory are accessible. Yeah, yeah but, but I, th yeah. I, th I think the interesting thing there is, is actually um, what are the vehicle capabilities? Because then, whilst accessibility isn't important now, then it may become in future, or it may be actually is the wheelchair bay full or something like that. That's a good point, Tim. We, we've had within Yorkshire, I'm not too sure the district arguments between disabled customers and pushchair users, people in. With, with babies in a pram taking over a disabled spot and causing the operator grief um, with discrimination because of doing that. So showing the available spaces on a bus, push chairs, wheelchairs, accessibility. Yeah, it, it comes down to, as you say, should you consider um, whether it's busy, empty or full now in the specification for what people might do in the future with more um, passenger counting solutions in yeah. general. Yeah, no, we'll so yeah. Okay. Um maybe the broad heading there is occupancy. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then once we've got the core information, we need to know some stuff about the status of the display and so um last time we identified the um heartbeat a display should should say whether it's still up and running on a regular basis um you need to know temperature um of the display to help with management of um the electronics um people would want to know how long the display's been up um you could learn from that whether it's just rebooted um or not um which might happen in between heartbeats in theory um self-test result so if they some displays do self tests when they power up and, and what the results of that are, if there's any uh, errors or whether it's all OK. Um, if it's got a shock sensor, whether that's activated or not. Um, the idea of the display, um, so you need to know which displays report in this data. Um, Pixel status, so whether there's any LEDs faulty or not. So I guess this will be partly some of these will be display um, capability dependent. Keith, sorry, it's only sensors. You've got shock sensor. You might have the audio sensor. You might have the CCTV sensor. So sensor could be more expanded upon if you wanted to for reporting purposes yes we're just thinking about yeah okay yeah 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 
I wondered if, um, I think we all, up in the domain, I think we know a lot about the standards for transport data. I'm just wondering if there's any standards for things like this for um, self-reporting diagnostics of, um, of devices that we could adopt. I, I, I don't know of any, I don't know if anybody else does. There, sorry, it's Nigel from Infotech. There's quite a lot of uh, um, um, things built into the display, um, which monitor the things like the heat, the temperature, sorry, the, the, of the display, the internal temperatures, etc. Um, you can put um, vandal sensors on there. Someone's tampered with the display, um, and then there's a RCMS will monitor. Um, the displays to see if they've done any self healing, if they've, you know, if they've lost data, if they've rebooted that type of thing, you can see all that type of thing. It tells you when it came off, when it turned on. Um, so <clears throat> the, the, a lot of these things are built into the display or if they're not, they can be. Yeah. 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 So it, this it is. is a. Sorry. Can I come in, Tim? Yeah. There is a concept there of communicating that information as well. Does the display send emails to a support desk telling the support desk this display has problems? Um, so what are, what are those mechanisms? What yeah. what we currently do for the for the rail industry, if a display reboots so many times within a period, it will say it will send out an email, but all the, the, the CMS prints a report every day. So for example, whoever the it's the allocated to within the rail, they will get an email and it will give them a, a list of displays that have, that have shown any type of uh, uh, um, results that they need to be aware of. So they could look at it and they can do predictive, predictive maintenance and things like this. Um, so yes, it can generate reports, which people can either receive or log into inspect Nigel, that, that's done by the CMS, though, presumably, rather than the display. The display it's is doing an email. The, yeah, the display is 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 got all the uh, um, uh, is, is, is got a lot of uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, self tested, etc. in there and, and will reboot. But the CMS is monitoring that. Mm. Yeah. So if it's rebooted it will, or even if it's offline, it can turn around and say this display is offline um, and it just or it or it, came, it went offline last night and it came back up this morning. It could have been someone turned the power off or it was a power cut in that area, but someone could be aware of it. But that that's the uh, that, that would be the CMS. The way we do it at the moment is with the CMS would actually generate that report. There's yeah. perhaps a need for yeah. both of those methods. If, if the computer's down then it can't communicate. So the CMS gives you that information daily. Um, our contractual relationship, though, is is based on service level agreements. So the sooner the support partner is told there's a fault, the sooner we can expect it to be up and running again. So if the display detects that it's got a problem with a component, and sending out an email straight off to a support partner means that it's going to get fixed more quickly rather than having to wait for a daily CMS report. So there's perhaps a need for both of those and the specification needs to maybe set out what the requirements for the data and, and everything else is um, in the specification. Is is that an interface specific? Is that the, for the interface to do or is that not for the CMS? Is that not CMS functionality? Um, possibly. So the display might send back to the CMS the fact that it's got a broken pixel and the service mm. level agreement might say if you have broken pixels they need to be repaired within four hours and thick or responded four hours fixed 10 hours whatever the service level agreement is so I the clock agree. starts as soon as that support contractor is told of the issue we start then the countdown um, so where that comes from it, it could be the display direct to the support partner it could be the display to the cms cms to support partner um, so there's, there's those different options, but this specification needs to be able to handle those scenarios. 
Yeah, I, I agree. It, it needs to be both ends. You know, we want proactive uh, monitoring uh, from our end as well as the display providers doing their job. You know, so the self-test results uh, where, where it's rebooted multiple times, things like that, you know, we want it to come back to the CMS and, you know, we can then keep an eye on, on a, are the display providers keeping up with their KPIs and fix them on time because we've got the results to say, well, it went down and never came back up. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what what is the interface functionality and what more realistically you would specify in in a the behavior of a content management system for that no I, it, it is just the fact that it needs to send up through the interface the fact that the results of a reboot or uh test results that's it not the fact that the cms has to do other stuff afterwards that's absolutely that's someone at someone else's problem or not not today's problem <laughs> yeah okay um i'm not sure which order um these are nigel first yeah i was just going to say with the cms you can we set it so that depending on whatever the fault is or or, or the record that's being needs to be shared it, it if it's just a reboot and it's rebooted three or four times in the course of a day that would we set that so that it would come up or that may come up on a report in the morning but if it's actually a fault that can be automatic and it does it straight away yeah. so you can set different uh, uh levels of inf uh, uh, reporting yeah okay um right who else have we got now um Dave and Keith. Dave and Keith. Yeah, I've, my screen's just gone mappy again. Yeah, Dave and then Keith. Uh, mine was an old hand. Sorry. Okay, fine. Um, it was only to say that I think there needs to be a differentiation what a display will, reports back from uh, loss of comms. You know, the display knows whether it's lost comms because of um, coverage or modem. Or whether it is the power cycle so you know whether you've got a comms problem or how long it is recycling and um, i suppose there's also the question about sending data from the cms to the display should there be a level of acknowledgement that it did receive this data or just you assuming that you've sent it it's got it depending on what protocol you take from that point of view and should you resend data if you didn't get it likewise linking to a reboot um should the display be holding um a lot of information or it's making sure that when it does reboot and it's lost its memory or what it had, that you are resending the whole 60 minute look ahead. So it's got up to date data. Yeah. Does that tie into the concepts in Siri where you specify the communications and the subscription push pull ports and stuff like that? <coughs> So can, can we learn from, can we take from Siri the communication protocols there and add them into the specification we're developing here? Yeah, and it is that type of, isn't it? Is it a subscription between the CMS and the display or is it uh, a request which comes into uh, what that specification will be? Yeah, yeah. OK, um, we'll come on to that in a bit um, here somewhere. That, when we talk about interface functions next. Um, so um, also um, people wanted to know um, audio triggers. So if, if audio has been triggered um, and then um, these aren't necessarily best placed. So what version of the software displays running um, and what version of firmware um, and what version of data if if you've got version on the data um claudio yeah um just a quick question do we want to control um some uh, parameters such as uh, um, the audio level for example the brightness of the displays remotely via the uh, via its software
what do others think about well, that? Would you want to do that remotely or would you want the display to do it automatically? Because obviously if you've got a display, again, we have this issue on, on the railway. Um, in the summer, we've had you know certain people stations. They've had complaints from people where they're getting audio announcements, and uh, um, but people have got their windows open, um, and at night they can audio can hear the announcements. You know, if you've got a train every three minutes, it can be quite annoying. Um, same with the brightness. If you've got a bus stop outside someone's house and they've got the window open, and and the announcements are going off, so you could set parameters to reduce the volume, reduce the brightness. Um, internally at the display so it can be automatic and but you can set those remotely yeah yeah so from a, a, a interface perspective you know do we need to be able to so it's probably on the previous one do those configurations uh, and send them down uh, you know brightness levels audio volumes etc or are we going to cover that on the next bit which is the interface well it's probably I'm not sure where, where where it sits in this arbitrary split that we're looking at. Here. Yeah, I also had the same job, probably in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let, let's capture it at least so we, we can work out where it sits later. So it's not yeah, all yeah. video and brightness and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um so yeah, so Leave you to know software and data versions, and then an interesting one um, because I suspect this is very display capability dependent. Snapshot of screen output and live view of of what's on the screen. Um, for some, that's easier than others. Nigel, I was just going to say we've um, what we do is we actually do. Um, we dive into the display and we can actually see what is being displayed, not the data that's been sent. Mm. So we can uh, um, we can with with our CMS we can dive in, look at it, and see what's actually being viewed on the display. Yeah. That can help with faults as well because you know you might think, oh, hang on, it's lost power. And if you do, you can delve it. You know, if you can't delve into it because it's lost power, then but you know it's uh, but you might find actually it. It's not receiving the data, but the display is working fine. Yeah, we sometimes have issues where the computer's working, it's sending stuff to the display, but it doesn't know that the display isn't working. So, is it possible to detect that a display isn't working rather than just checking that the computer's up and running? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would say yes, it is. You, you, because we know. We can check if the data is being sent, yeah, uh, and we can do a mimic of the display to see if the display, if you can't get a mimic, then you know the display is not working, but then you can do health checks remotely. Yeah, I suspect some of that's down to yeah. the capability of displays, the display itself. Dave? Yeah, I think that question of the um, snapshot of screen output raises a couple of questions. Um, if the intention is that the, um, uh, I suppose one way is to say that the, it puts a requirement on the display to be able to screenshot itself and send that information back through some channel, which is probably the most reliable way of doing it. And it sounds like the, the, the Infotech solution does that. And that might be a good way of advocating uh, that solution. But it starts to push beyond the envelope of this towards what the capability of these displays selves are uh, and what they might be able to do. Um, and that's going to be easier for some displays than others, like a dot matrix thing is going to be you know, much harder. Um, I think also then we're looking at, um, yeah, the, if it's the other assumption that the CMS is going to send them exactly what the, the screen is to display, then it's starting to mandate exactly how everything is, is, is formatted and how it's marked up and every color and pixel, rather than please display this information in a way that makes sense to you. So I think it raises a couple of important questions that are getting bottomed out here, but I'm still not entirely clear on, you know, is, is the CMS mandating like every pixel and therefore it knows exactly what's gonna be on that screen or is it giving it information to uh, format in a, in a way that it sees fit? And likewise, are we expecting displays to have the capability to send back a screenshot of themselves? I think I think you've got to look at how the data is being provided. If it's raw data and the intelligence is being done in a display, 
then the display takes uh, can, can work out the layouts, the way uh, uh, all the information is presented, the look aheads, etc. It can do all of that. If you're going to allow the CMS to drive it and load the software onto the display on a Linux platform, or as, then you've got to rely upon the CMS. But letting the display do a lot of the intelligence, you're, you're bringing both of the CMS and the uh, um, display together, and you can get a lot more information, a lot more feedback. I, I that in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's a question of you know what. We're interested in is making sure the interface can provide enough configuration data, real time data, uh, other data as required for for the you know the authorities to have control over it. You know we want it in a different place. We want to swap uh, uh, the um, I don't know the service uh, service number from the start to the middle. I don't know, it would be a bit stupid to do that, but as an example, they want to swap it around. So whilst the some of the intelligence will still be in the displays, it's about making sure the configuration of what will be displayed is uh, at a level where the, uh, the authorities have that control um, rather than and are arbitrarily told, okay, you can only have messages on the bottom row, as an example. All, all of that is configurable. Yeah. yeah. So you, it can be done. You can, for example, at different times of day, you could have the intelligent script inside the display that shows uh, uh, the layout in one way. But then it, if, the, if the operator wants to change that layout uh, and put different messages up at a different time of day, but they've got less services, for example, they could. Yeah. But is, is that consistent across other display providers or is that very specific to what you guys do? I, I, I don't I don't know exactly what. Again, a lot of this is dependent upon how the other manufacturers yeah. uh, um, design and their what, displays. You know, this interface has to be consistent to be able to give us you know, something that will work across near enough all displays subject to maybe uh, additional, a bit of additional hardware or interfacing with a, a CMS. Um, but it, it needs to be something we, we can use. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that other local authorities will, will say the same. Uh, you can have one CMS, but you could have different displays from different vendors, and it needs to be able to work with you know, all of those vendors. It needs I, to be I, universal, doesn't it? I think the problem you've got is that different display manufacturers um, will use different uh, um, technology uh, in regards to some of them will have um, Windows based uh, PCs, uh, embedded PCs inside, and then it's completely run a different way. Uh, and this is where this interface has got to be that bridging, you know, the bridge between allowing those who are using Linux, those who are using Windows, those using something else. Yeah. Okay, Claudia. Yeah, maybe just a um, uh, quick word on that. Uh, so, um, uh, yes, we we our approach is to have uh, some kind of uh, intelligence inside the display, uh, which is needed because of the service functions. So, uh, diagnostic, uh, LED diagnostic, and the setting all the functions and so on. So, we believe that. Uh, um, display has to be smart anyway uh, with an embedded PC with uh, uh, an OS but for the sake of uh, flexibility and versatility uh, it should be um, controlled uh, in a standard way uh, so, so our opinion is that when it comes to content but also when it comes to controlling some specific uh, functions uh, um probably a light cms running on each single display would allow uh, to create a sort of common interface with interface which can be based on html uh, for example and uh, provide let's say a universal um interface towards any kind of uh, central software so uh, just to make an example uh, we spoke about uh, sending emails uh, so a light CMS on board 
of, uh, uh, of an embedded PC inside the display would be able uh, to send out uh, emails autonomously in case of some failures. Uh, and then it could be backed up by a centralized software that once a day, once every two days, receives uh, the logs and uh, backs up. OK, uh, Dave. I can see again. Sorry, okay. <laughs> I'll to put my hand there. Uh, Stephen, then. Yeah, it's it's, it's the um, operating system version. I can't see that on a picture, so apologies if you've got it already, Tim. Um, but it'd be useful to know the operating system the display type is running. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Keith, is that a legacy hand? Um, no, it kind of comes down to a, a bit of the architecture, really. From what I'm getting, we're saying is you've got the CMS, which is going to send all the data to the display. Um, the display is going to feed back to the CMS, I'd say, from a full reporting point of view. Um, the display itself will manage and display within a uh, presentation within agreed layouts. And then you've got a discovery server. But where does the discovery server really sit? Is it a separate um, server where it will um, the display will go off to that <coughs> server, get its build code, whatever it is, all of its ID and parameters will be controlled within the discovery server. Um, and where you can make changes for all the layouts and the presentations according to your layout, for instance. Because I mentioned that's what someone else has done before. So, you know, display powers are up. It goes to the discovery server, gets all its parameters, it's a display presentation, you know, and then it gets the data from the CMS. Yeah, and so whatever... that's moving on to the next bit, which um, it might be the right time to do that. Um, but is there anything more in faults and reporting that is fundamental to this that's, that's a must have? No, so that does take us on to um, the, some of the more specific things about the interface um, and how that works. So we've talked a number of times about discovery and the need for that, and that's what you were sort of um, discussing there, Keith. Um, do we need some way of a display? telling the CMS this is our capability um, or is that pre-programmed in the CMS already so you know that a display is of this type and has got those capabilities? If that was a question to me, sorry. Uh, I, I, I'm only going from what I know before, but you know, if your discovery server can control the display layout, um, I think it's best to be separate from the CMS telling what the display layout is. If that makes sense. Your discovery server, all the displays talk to that. That's what configures your layout, and it can work across um, display types and, and manufacturers if you had a standard um, discovery and parameter setting. Stephen? Okay, is, is there a requirement to know what functionality globally is available and then selecting? subgroups of that for each display type so the interface is is used for some mechanism to tell cms that it has this capability yeah and that's maybe yeah the other way around as well yeah okay rob this is heading more in towards your sort of um arena It is indeed. Um, I'm a little bit wary of the um, time constraints that we've also got here. Yes. Um, I don't know how far we want to deep dive into um, this interface functions section or whether we just want to do a very light version of this and then take a quick look at the um, technology section in the uh, to the right on your um, screen share just to give people forewarning about the sorts of things that we want to consider. 
um, and then perhaps arrange a, a very technically detailed session um, at a future date where we can really hammer out some of this um, technical stuff. Yeah, that's probably a sensible thing to to set something up for next week to look at this. So, yeah, so at a high level then. Okie dokie. So, I mean, we've we've touched on this discovery um, and, and I'm not entirely sure I know what the answer to this is. You know, what is the purpose of discovery? Is it something that's done during commissioning of a new sign only? Um, or is there more to it than that? Um, you know, is 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 there something more regular about a, a sign just reminding a CMS or indeed a separate discovery server was mentioned? I'm, I'm not clear on the purpose of, of that, if it's separate from the CMS, but but maybe somebody has uh, some thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I'm, I can share some thoughts. I discovery, think... and... Sorry, Sorry go I on. can share some thoughts, yeah. Um, rolling out, say, updates to displays. If you install new displays, for example, making it simple for the display to be switched on and then go off and collect parameters that tell that display that it's this bus stop number simplifies that upgrade process. So as part of that interface, being able to define the display ID and then that display ID is being set up in the back office to show departures for stop number XYZ simplifies that rollout process and similarly, if, if the display is swapped out, you don't have to tec technically go into the system to reconfigure it. When this, the new display that's replacing the old one is switched back on, it gets its parameters. And that perhaps covers updates as well. Operating systems do get updated over time. Um, so being able to control when they're updated and that process of the interface has that should have that capability. That's kind of what your current system does now, Steve, and you're, 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 whether you use it or not, you know, everything maintenance, moving display from one location to another location, you yeah. know, so you're reconfiguring it. That's all done within the discovery and its layout. And it, yeah. it's potentially a way to manage those different displays, whether you've got one from A and they need to do an update, well, they log onto discovery and do it, you know, yeah. display from B, they, they're all doing it through the same, um, discovery system basically but yeah. potentially that's a lot more work but it might be the way to um have more control and oversight from that perspective it's it's, it's opening us we, we've got different support partners who do things in different ways so what we're leading to here is a standard way of doing things which supports which each of those support partners then support for us um so some of them you know the technician goes out and he has to go into the operating system on a device and type in the stop number just prone to mistakes and not working properly so that discovery optimizes getting the correct information to the display and then standardizing that as an open standard means that we don't get tied into a proprietary method with one supplier which differs to a proprietary method with another supplier yeah i think we need to be careful here um about not um tying things too tightly because then you stop innovation and one supplier being more efficient than another and, and you end up potentially driving yourselves to the lowest common denominator if we're not careful um you know and, and so how do suppliers differentiate each other if you're going to force a particular way of working on so i think we just need to you know be careful of that through this design process okay um i think we've probably covered that one off at least as, as much as we can today um we are going to run out of time here but um the, the next big topic i think is this security um that's listed on the interface functions there. And actually, there's there's a big crossover there with um, interface functions and the, um, and the, the, the technical detail of what we're doing as well there, technical requirements, as, as you put it there, and security falls into both camps. Um, I'm curious to understand how this works in practice with uh, the existing signs. Um, you know, do we use encrypted 
data to communicate between um, the CMS and the signs? Um, do you have some level of authentication on every message? You know, is it a basic authentication username and password or would you consider or should we consider using sort of web standards, OAuth, that sort of thing? I mean, it seems a bit heavyweight for communication to assign, but these are the sorts of things that I really want to understand in terms of what's currently out there um, and what sign manufacturers in particular would consider the best way moving forward. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any comments specifically on security. That is something I'd like to just have a two minute look at today whilst we've uh, whilst we've got people on the call. Yeah, maybe just a quick one on this. Uh, um, yeah, it's uh, encryption is uh, uh, several times we we are asked to implement encryption uh, for the communication with the um, with the central CMS. Uh, uh, depending on uh, each country regulation uh, standards and each operator's uh, uh, feeling about uh, about that. So, so yeah, but that is uh, possible uh, when you have an embedded PC with enough uh, um, with enough uh, let's say, uh, calculation power to to mm -hmm. make uh, to implement any kind of uh, encryption software. Is that typically the case of a three-line LED display, um, no. or would that not have significant <laughs> power? No, uh, it's it's they can ignore the case of uh, well TFTs, but also LEDs uh, in full matrix, uh, which have quite a uh, typically a bigger um, size, uh, therefore additional room for uh, an embedded computer. Okay, so that opens us up potentially to to having this level of security dependent on the type of sign, which is not an ideal situation. So I, I guess uh, we need to talk a little bit more with the um, Transport for Wales team to to determine, you know, what 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 the thoughts are on on security. Um, mm -hmm. right. Um, I don't know anyone else. I think yes, Stephen. Yeah, sure. Thank you. The other side of that is that security is a hindrance it stops you doing things as quickly as you maybe want to um, so from an operational perspective minimal security that prevents somebody putting inappropriate messages on the display so at the moment all we do is we log into the content management system and that generates what we want to go on the display and that provides good enough security um, operating systems might weaken that so it's, it's balancing the device operating systems, the security that comes with that, and the requirements of as an authority, making sure that we don't show inappropriate content on a display and doing that as easily and efficiently as possible. Absolutely. Um, uh, Keith. No expert, Rob, but obviously a display might have physical constraints from getting into the display. If you're in the display, then and if you try to plug into most things, it's going to be password protected at some level. You know, communication, I expect, between um, servers and CMS is already done over HTTPS. And I suppose most of the communications are normally done over a VPN with the security within itself from that point of view. Um, that was the I, next I'm thing. Not up, yes. that, I'm not aware that lots of people would, would actually encrypt the data as it's sent and then decrypt it. You know, it might be encrypted on the display once it's there. You know, and likewise on, on the servers, but I suppose it comes down to the type of data. You know, end of the day, it's open data. Um, so, do you need to actually encrypt it? Um, yes, you want to prevent people from accessing it and changing something. Um, but I suppose the flip side is, if a display capability has CCTV, then that needs a higher level of security and how that is sent transmission and access to it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've you've hit on the. Um you know the concept of vpn there and, and that potentially can solve a lot of the problems um as just a i, know, I appreciate where we're sort of out of time but um, as a really quick um poll um are all current sign manufacturers using vpns is anyone not um nigel uh yeah well we depends on the uh, uh Yes, we did, but you know, where, where it's required. <laughs> Put it the bloody. I was just going to say on the security side, one of the things that we, we did, we give people different access levels. 
Okay. Yeah, so uh, yep. not not everybody can uh, change the information on the display. Some some people may you know maintainers may be able to go in and look at a display, but they won't be able to change any information. Okay, I mean that that sounds like security within the CMS app that's pre preventing different users from doing different things. Yeah, I, I, I think most most CMS would do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Right, I'll I'll hand back over to Tim. I think because we're sorry, sort of sorry, running Rob. over. Sorry, oh sorry. Well, no, I, but I would say that most people in the UK would use a private VPN, but I'm aware outside, then people do use a public VPN, which therefore would need more security. Hmm. I, th I think VPNs might be a bit cumbersome, possibly for for this. There there could be better Can ways. We, yeah. There could be alternatives. Um, mm. And. Uh, I, yes, I think we, we probably need to arrange a separate session specifically about this sort of stuff, don't we, Tim? Yeah, so in terms of um, what we do to look at this, if we um, arrange for another call next Thursday morning, give people a week's notice, um, will that work for people to specifically talk about these interfaces and the more technical side of things. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not I've, I've seen a couple of thumbs up, um, no dissent. So um, we'll uh, we'll arrange something um, uh, for um, next week to, to look at this in more detail. Um, OK. Um, so, um, can I ask a quick question on that, Tim? Yeah. Is it possible to share contact details with whoever's attending today uh, to allow conversations to happen in the background and report back next Thursday? Um, if, yeah, if people don't want me to, to share their um, email addresses then please let me know um, and I'll circulate uh, contacts tomorrow morning to give people time to opt out. Okay, um, thank you for your time this morning. Um, it's been a good set of discussion and debate and um, uh, given us a lot to um, think about and um, work on, um, but um, it's helping move things forward a lot. So thank you. Um, and um, we will uh, arrange something for next Thursday morning. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody.